Um, let's just pray. Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to gather together and seek you, Lord God, and to just get in the word and just um, set this small time of our busy week and our busy lives away to just hear your voice and seek you. And um, we just thank you for that opportunity. We ask that angels be around Pastor John as he's traveling and that this time will just be sweet and he comes back with amazing stories and a new vision for what this year has for us. In your name I pray, amen. He's really excited. If you remember two summers ago, Pastor Tong and Sister Chang came here from Burma, and their brother is in um, Washington, D.C., so I gets to spend some time with him. And that he was, very, he was really looking forward to that. That would be a great thing. And so it's awesome to see. Um, if you ever get the chance to go on a missions trip with them, it, it's awesome to see these people that have grabbed hold of Dad and have, uh, man, they are influenced by him, and he's one of the, maybe the only strong, stable figures in their life and so his impact is great and it's just awesome to see the friendship that's um, been created through all these years and I know he's going to come back energized and he's going to give them a fresh vision and encourage them as he's there. So we've been talking the last few, actually all of February, we talked about discipleship and um, I just have been getting so much out of it. I Discipleship, I used to hear all these things, well come to my discipleship Bible study or whatever and I'd be like, I had a really naive and really dumb view of discipleship, and I just thought, okay, so you want me to be like you? Well, I don't know that I want to be like you, but okay. I mean, I just had a really naive look at discipleship, and in the last month and the last year that we've really been digging into discipleship, man, God's brought so much into my life from it. You know, one of the when I asked my SELA kids what, what their perception of discipleship is, they had the same answer I did. Well, Jesus had 12 disciples. I mean, that was one of my, again, one of my early viewpoints of discipleship. Well, Jesus just had his 12 that followed him while he was on this earth, and that was, you know, what discipleship is. And the other part was when the Bible says to go out and make disciples, I thought, how, how am I to do that? How, how do I have my life together that I want to say, yeah, come do what I'm doing? Do I really have myself together that I want to point them to me and direct them to what I'm doing? But man, how naive and conceited was that? <laughs> I'm not pointing them to me. I'm pointing them to God. I'm pointing them to a deeper relationship with him. Man, Christianity, we use that word, and it's such a great starting point, but that is exactly what Christianity is. It is a starting point. It is not the end result. It's not... I received Christ, and that was good. That is a starting point. I mean, amazing. What, what Christ did on the cross was amazing. What his grace and his mercy has done for us is amazing. But it's just a starting point. It's not just our ticket to heaven, which is awesome, great. But it's a starting point to live our daily lives with him, to, man, to be uh, consumed with the things of God, to have him involved in our daily walk. That is discipleship. And so I want to read out of um, John chapter 15. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. You know, we are called to go and make disciples. We are. We're called to do that. But in order for me to go make disciples, in order for me to point them back to Christ, I need to work on my own discipleship. I need to work on, on my, how I'm following Christ and my relationship with him and what that involves. And am I a true disciple? You know, uh, I have several friends who would claim that they're Christians and they believe in God, and I think that's awesome, and I think that's great. But do you have an intimate walk with Christ? Do you have a daily walk with Christ? Does he ha- have you given him permission to have a rule and reign in every area of your life? You know, that, that is something that I strive for, and that's something that we're all going for. But I'm going to read on the Message Bible, so I love the Message Bible. And obviously you know that because I've read it every time I've been up here. But um, John chapter 15, 1 through 11, it says... I am the real vine, this this is Jesus speaking, and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that does not bear grapes, and every branch that is grape-bearing, he prunes back so it will bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message that I have spoken to you. Live in me. Make your home in me, just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, You can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. 
separated, you cannot produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourself at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you produce grapes, when you mature as disciples, I've loved you the way my father has loved me. Make yourself at home in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. Kept my father's commandments, and I made myself at home in his love. Uh, That's been a scripture verse. I spoke on this a few weeks ago in Selah, and it's been a scripture verse that's just been on my heart. Make yourself at home in his love. You know, a vine. I talked about this. Uh, If you've ever been out to my parents' house, they have grapevines on their deck. And um, if you haven't, the next time you go, look at them because it's... Those grapevines are not going anywhere. They are wrapped around that deck. And uh, one day I went over there, and it was growing up their table that they had on their deck, and they had to cut it away. I mean, a vine will go for as long... I mean, it just... Whatever it finds, it wraps itself around. And if you look at it now, man, those branches, they are thick. They are sturdy. They are... They're not a flimsy little twig. They are strong. Man... I want to be intertwined with God. I want, I mean, I don't want it to be, um, yes, I go to church on Sunday and I worship him and that's great. No, I want my whole life to be intertwined in his. I I don't want to know where it begins and where it ends because I'm so intertwined with him. And the more I grow and the stronger I get, man, those roots go down deeper. He's my root system. I go down deeper and deeper. I get stronger and stronger. And I'm getting, and I mean, everything belongs to him. I don't know where I end and where he begins. I'm so wrapped up in him. And, you know, I read this book when I was um, single, and it was, ta- I don't even remember the title, but basically it was the concept that women think of everything as like spaghetti. When you put spaghetti on a plate, it's all together you know it's just men are a little bit more like waffles they can put it in you know parts so they have like these little compartments thank you they compartmentalize things and you know they that's an amazing gift I wish I had sometimes (laughs) but they can do that but you know women with spaghetti and just our emotions and just the way we handle things. I mean, you know, my kid uh, affects my work. My work affects my kid. Everything is, is touching everything else. It involves everything else. Man, when I dig in and I start applying the word of God to my life, I don't compartmentalize him. I don't make, this is your area, God. I've devoted this time. No, it touches everything. I'm intertwined. It intertwines itself in everything, in every area of my life. You know, I've been... um seeing different articles on separation of church and state. And you can have your opinion about it. Thank God for our men and women who fight for the right for us to have our own opinions. But really, what he was talking about was not that government, that we should not, the church should not have a place in government, but that government was not to get involved in how the church was ran. You know, then you can have lots, I could go on that bandwagon for a while, but I'm not going to. But, um, I don't want to have a separation of church and state in my life. And what I mean by that is I don't want to have a separation of, God, uh, I want you in this area. I'm really needing you in this area. But, you know, my marriage, I'm okay, so you really don't need to get involved there. And, man, God, I, man, my financially, I really need your help, and I really need your guidance, I really need your advice. But, oh, my relationship with my friends and coworkers, that's okay. Don't worry about it. No, I don't want to have a separation. I want him to ooze into every area of my life. I want every area of my life to be intertwined in what the word of God has to say. Every decision I make, I want it to be based on what he has been leading me and guiding me. And I ha- in order to do that, I have to get myself intertwined into the word of God. I have to have that word of God inside of me. I have to have it taking root in my life and taking a place in my heart and and digging its roots down really, really deep in my life so that I can ooze out in every area on other people and have him come out in every area of my life. And that there is no question. Like I said, okay, I can see where God's manifesting in this area. In my whole life, he's involved. I'm intertwined in him. I, I, I'm involved. I don't, I don't seek him just once a week. I seek him every day. I'm a, I, I want him in my, era, in my life every day. And so 
I believe that when, when, once we start doing that, when we've given him control of all the areas of our life and we've given him um, uh, the permission to come in and seek our dark places, man, this is something for the last year that's been really on my heart. Uh, I am not perfect and I would not claim to be, but I, I want, and I want to be teachable. I want to be teachable. I don't want to not to, to ever think that I have arrived or ever think that I've got it all made. I want him to search my dark places and bring light to them. I want those things that I've hidden for him, those hurts that I've hidden, whatever I've hidden in my heart, I want him to search my heart and, and heal it and touch it and, and, and bring life into those places that I'm, I'm a dead branch man pruning I, okay, I just bought a house this year, and it had rose bushes everywhere, and it was gorgeous. And when I drove up and saw this gorgeous house with all these rose bushes and plants, I thought, oh, this is the house. I love it. And then we moved in, and I thought, oh, crud, I'm in charge of it. <laughs> I, have, I'm, I have to take care of these rose bushes. I'm not, you know, Elisa comes and plants my garden. I am not a, a farmer. I'm not a, a gardener. I am so... That I'm so not good and gifted in that area. And I sat there, and fall was coming, and everyone's telling me, you're going to have to prune back your rose bushes. Oh, I don't think I want to do that. Oh, nope, you got to do it. It's just this time of year, blah, blah, blah. So I consulted with my mom, Cheryl Trocomoy, and she's an amazing gardener. And so I called her several times, and she came over and looked at him. Oh, yep, you just chop, chop, chop. No, no, tell me what to chop. Like, let's put little markers around each branch that I should chop. I'm like, I do not want... I want to see rose bushes next spring. I want to see some that beautiful love when I drove up to the house. I want to see it again in the spring. And oh no no, don't worry, it'll be okay. But man, when I went to make my first cut, holy Toledo, I was nervous. I was, please God, let there be roses next year. You know, and just I I went there, but you know, it's in that scripture verse, it talks about where God cuts away the dead branches. I know I have dead branches in my life. I know I have areas in my life that I'm not producing. I know I have areas in my life that I have hurts, and I have, uh, you know, I have things that I haven't fully let go of. I want God to come into my life and cut those away. You know, so often we don't want to let things go because then I don't have an excuse. Or I don't want to let this hurt go because then I don't have a reason for why I'm bummed all the time. Or, you know, whatever it may be be or man if he cuts this away because it's not producing then it means I failed no that's not what it means at all man he's pruning you so that you produce more fruit so that you 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 can grow and become everything that he's created you be to be as beautiful as he's created you to be and and I want him to come into my life and take those things away as often as I mean as many times maybe my flesh will rise up and say no 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 that's okay God that area I'm going to hold on to that a little bit longer. Me having a grudge against my husband, I'll hold on to that just a little bit longer, okay? It's really not that big of a deal. Uh, No, I want him to cut that out of my life. I want him to take that away. You know that song, that scripture verse, and it says he's the God that gives and takes away. I struggled with that for so long because, I I mean, you know, I I just did. But then someone explained it to me. He takes away the stuff I don't want. Yes, God, I hand you over the stuff I don't want in my life. I hand you over that dead branch. I hand, I hand that over that area. And maybe the world will say it looks like I failed. And maybe in my own heart it looks like I failed. But I haven't. I'm, I'm being pruned back. I'm being shapened. I'm being, uh, uh, being prepared for what's coming next in my life. And if I want to go on to what's coming next in my life, I can't hold on to those dead branches. You know, if I want my garden to look good next year, I'm going to have to work on pulling out some weeds. Uh, I was telling the story to my Sela kids. I had, we lived in a trailer house for many years, and it was great, and we, it was a great experience. We had a flower bed, and it was my garden. Oh, it was so nice. Lisa, of course, planted it. And then um, I was to maintain it. Well, you know, last year we put our house up on the market, and we believe in that we want to sell it. You know, we have a little boy now, and believe in that our family will get bigger in the years to come, and trailer house, you know, this house just wasn't going to fit our needs anymore. And so we started believing and put our house on the market, and of course it wasn't selling, because it wasn't selling. And so halfway through the summer, I realized, you know, I have this mentality, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get rid of this house. I'm going to sell this house. And I realized I really hadn't paid attention to those flowers in my flower bed. And man, were there some weeds in there. And they were taller 
than my plants, and they were choking out the beauty of this amazing daisy plant that I had. It was gorgeous, but I really couldn't see it because I had all this other junk around it. I had failed to go out there every day and pluck those weeds when they were this big, and now I'm going to have to get some heavy-duty muscle and tools to get these weeds out of my garden. And man, I don't want my life to get to that point where I really, no, I want to maintain. I want, man, I see something, God, take it on me. Man, I see a weed, I want to get rid of that. I don't want to hold on to bitterness. I don't want to hold on to um, a wrong thought. I don't want to hold on to a wrong belief. Man, if you're like me, I am pretty confident in what I believe. And so when someone comes and challenges what I believe, I I have something rises up in me. But I want, if man, if I have a belief that is not of God, I want him to come in and show me how that's not of him. And I want to rip that out of me so that I can go on and produce all the fruit that he's asked me to do. You know, and for so long I thought, oh, it meant me on my own producing something, making disciples that looked like me. I'm going to make my Sela kids all look like me. I mean, I really thought that, and to a degree, yeah, I mean, I want them to be as passionate as I feel that I am about Christ. But you know what? They're not going to look like Jody, so that would be creepy and it would be weird. But um, <laughs> if I had a mini army... I haven't thought that. I've thought about that. That would be kind of cool, too, to have a mini army. But, I mean, I don't want them to look like me. I want them to look like their heavenly father. I want to sit there every week and point them to the things of God and say, man, I, we've been, I, to be honest, if you ever want to come down, we do not talk about silly. We don't talk about how it's nice to be. In, uh, I don't even know how to say this and not be condescending. But we talk about real things in my seagull class. I mean, we talk about, I'm, we're giving them meat. Jen and I, we're, give, we're not spoon-feeding these kids anymore. They are getting meat, and they are really having to uh, think about it, chew on it. They come up with the best questions. Man, Noah has the best analogies that in these sports terminology that I would have never thought of. I mean, they are getting the word of God. And I, my, what's my goal? My goal is to not make them look like me or do what I do. Uh, my goal is for them to realize that, yes, being a Christian is great, but that is a starting point. They can have a real relationship with Christ. They can be a disciple of Christ. They can be a follower of Christ all the days of their life. And at nine years old is a perfect time to start that. You don't have to start it at 19, 29, 39. 49 you can start it at nine years old and have this intimate walk with christ and i guess that i know i'm stumbling over some words and for three days i've been going i don't know what i'm supposed to say and i don't have a clear thought and i know i'm stumbling over but really my heart's cry is this that yes to stay is to stand and say i believe in god and i'm going after things of him and i believe in him and i go to church on sunday and that's great but no every day you can have an intimate walk with him an intimate walk with him where a man uh I, I i just talk to god all day i when i talk to my kids about that when they walk in their hallways that's a perfect time to talk to christ to talk to god to say okay it doesn't have to be a sit down kneel down prayer it's a, i communicate with him all day long every day i have an intimate walk with him i am a follower of christ and it means that what he asks me to do i will do if he tells me to go make disciples i'll go make disciples if he tells me to to bless this person i'll bless this person and at nine years old man my kids are getting it and not all of them are nine but they are getting it and they're applying it to their life and you can see it coming out of them and my prayer is is that i be the same way man i'm here sitting there going okay i'm going to lead, lead them to god i'm going to point them to god i'm going to show them that they can have a real relationship with them with him but they are showing me how on a daily basis i can have a real relationship with them a real relationship not this fairy tale thing not this um on the surface thing and i, I read my bible and that, no a real in-depth relationship with christ where I don't know where I end and where he begins. I'm so intertwined to the things of God. I'm so involved in the things of God. And so often, I know for me personally, when I talk up here, I, I was thinking about this the last time I spoke, and I got done, I thought, I really hope they didn't think that I was just talking about ministry. No, did you know? Man, every area of our life, this is what God's called us to do. You don't have to have a pulpit. You don't have to have uh, um, a ministry. It's God's just called us to go out and make disciples in every, every area of our life. And so um, in, let's go to Matthew 10, verse 42. 
So I, I believe that as we focus on our discipleship and as we get involved in, in the things of God, as we let him take hold of our lives, if we let, as we let him shine his light in the dark areas, as we get just our everyday life becomes more and more intertwined with him, I believe then that that's when we go out and make disciples, and that's how we go out and touch others, and that's how we point others to him. And so often, like I was saying, we, we feel like we have to have these grandiose ways of doing it, and we have to have these big productions and, and have all these people come hear me. I need to go to another country or whatever it may be. But, man, it's so much simpler and subtle, more subtle than that. And so in Matthew 10... Um, Chapter 10, verse 42, it says, And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. The simple things in life. Man, the Bible study we're going through is talking about you're worth more than you think you are. You're um, something like that effect. I think I messed that title up. But anyways, and she's just talking about in our daily lives, we don't even realize how much we're doing for God. We don't even realize the impact we're having on other people. So, man, you give a cup of cold water to somebody, you're being a disciple. You're being a follower of Christ. You're doing it in the name of Jesus. You're doing it to bless him. And so oftentimes we think we have to have these big things, but did you know that when you're the co-worker at work that is not afraid to go up to someone and pray with them when they're in need, to give when God tells you to give, to, to um, believe for someone's healing when he tells you to believe for someone's healing, those are huge things, and that is a real relationship with God. It's not having a soapbox. It's not having a platform. It's everyday life. That is a real and intimate relationship with Christ. That's a follower of Christ. Man, when you just let that ooze out of you, when you're not, when you, you just, when you love the unlovable, man, I watch some people who love an unlovable child or love an unlovable person, and I, my heart's just like, how, how do you, the grace you have, the mercy you have, that is being a disciple. That is, that is being a follower of Christ. That is letting everything that, is ta- that you have put in your heart, you've let that take root in your heart. You've let that establish in your heart, and then you're living out of that. And when you live out of all that stuff that you've put in your heart, you're going to ooze God's goodness on everyone around you. It, you can't help it. It's going to overflow. It's going to, man, you're just constantly directing people to him. You're constantly being a light to him. And oftentimes we write ourselves off because we think we need to have this big thing. And really, it's just living our lives faithful day in and day out to the way that God's called us to do it. And to when he says to do something, we do it. We obey. We, we listen to his voice and we obey. And we don't, we don't hesitate when he's asked us to do something. And that is, man, that is being a disciple. And that is a real relationship with Christ. You know, another thing that I, we point out to our kids all the time is I want you to have a real relationship with Christ. Being a disciple of Christ is having a real relationship. That means some days are going to be a struggle. That means some days are going to, you're not going to feel like you have it all together. But to have a real relationship means you just keep going. You still just, you keep feeding yourself. You keep getting intertwined. You rest with his, you make your home in his love. You let his love who's around you. You set in it. You soak in it. You, you just can't get enough of it. And when you get soaked in his love, his love's going to come out of you. You're going to touch all the people around you. And you're going to be, man, you're pointing them back to Christ. And so, um, okay, we're going to go there. Let's go to Luke 14. In verse 15. Ooh, you know what? That's not it. Wow, sorry. That is not it. I apologize. <laughs> but um, I was reading this book, and it was an awesome book. And it talked about how oftentimes we worry about... Um, being a good person or being a good Christian or, okay, well, I compare myself. Well, I have some faults, but I don't have as many faults as that person. Man, we can get into that comparison and we, we, um, we, we just do that. I've done it in my life and we say, well, I keep the Ten Commandments, so I'm good there. And, you know, but really what it's about is obeying the king and doing what he's asked us to do. And if that is simply to, you know, to, to 
just be a stay-at-home, that's not simply, but be a stay-at-home mom and be the parent that he's asked you to be. You're being a disciple of Christ. You're being what he's asked you to be. You're obeying the commandments he's asked you to be. If it's to go out into the highways and byways and, and, and grab people in and bring them into the church, you're doing what he's asked you to do. If it's to be that positive role model at your work or your school or in your environment, you're doing what he's asked you to do. You are being a disciple of Christ. You're being a follower of him. And so we let's not get caught up in the comparison and, and the I did this and so I'm, I'm pretty good no I'm doing what my father's asked me to do and that is the only thing that matters and his opinion is the only opinion that matters is what my heavenly father has asked me to do and I'm going to do everything he's asked me to do and I'm going to obey him and I'm going to be intertwined in him I'm going to make my home in him I'm going to rest in his love I'm going to rest in all the goodness and the faithfulness and all the amazing things that he has for me because he has amazing things for us and so I know I feel like I've stumbled over my words today, that I've not gotten everything that um, I wanted to get out, but I'm going to ask Jen if she'll come and play the piano. I'm throwing this at her last minute. Discipleship. What does it mean to you? And I guess that's what a lot of we've talked and prayed about. Man, our heart's cry is that you take what you hear here and you go home and you dig in for yourself and you, you get into the word of God for yourself and you apply it to your life yourself and you find truths and you find all those hidden things. And man, discipleship, what a glorious thing to be a follower of Christ, to be his child, to be intimately intertwined with him. And I can be. It talks about it. I can be. I can be his vine. I can produce good fruit. I can, I can. And why write myself off? And why say, well, no, it's just good enough. I'm just doing good enough by getting by and being a good person. That's awesome that you're a good person. I know lots of good people. But you can have a real intimate relationship with him. A real walk with him. A one that, man, is not compartmentalized, that is not separated, but he has his influence and his effect on every area of your life. You've let him come in and touch your heart in every area of your life. Man, your finances, your marriage, your relationship with others, your, um, your job, whatever it may be, you let him come in and have his influence and have his rule and have his reign in your life. And you don't, you don't hold back. You just, man, come in to me. Heal those hurts. Come to those dark places. Make your light shine. Bring truth to those situations. Man, I have a real relationship. Man, a real relationship doesn't always look pretty, does it? It's not always wonderful. It's not always the movie picture perfect thing. It's real. It's raw. Your husband, your spouse, they see the side of you nobody else sees. They see the negative. They see the good. Man, that's having a real relationship with God, allowing him to come in and see all that, fix all that, heal all that. And out of that, then, man, I can go out and I can point others to him. When I have him, I'm intertwined with him. So if you just stand with me right now. Thank you, Jesus. I can set up here and I can give you every scripture verse and I can tell you it's really awesome to be a disciple. It's really awesome to be a follower of Christ and what all that means. But really until you've had that moment that you've made that decision, my words are just words. My heart cry is that in your alone time with God, that light be shined, his word become real to you, his word become alive in you. And there's no better time to start than now. You know, this story's been on my mind, and I wasn't going to tell it because I thought this is kind of weird, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, Pastor Bobby used to tell me the story of this lady who um, all her life, 
growing up believed that she was called, she knew God had called her to the ministry, knew that God had a plan for her life, knew that she was called to missions. And as she, you know, she grew up just knowing that and believing that. And she married a man, he didn't, his relationship with Christ was not the same, and he didn't have a heart for missions and didn't have a heart to really serve. And she, you know, she stood by him, and, and, and I believe she made an influence in where she was, and she loved him and was faithful to him. And in her 70s, when he died, the first thing she did was sell everything and go to the mission field. And live the rest of her life out on the mission field. You can say, well, she married, no. I don't know if she married the wrong guy, she didn't marry the right I don't know that. But I know that it's in her 70s, she was like, I, can still, I still got it. There's no better time than now. You're not too late. You're not too early. I tell my Sila kids that all the time. It's not too early. And there's really, it's not too late to start this intimate, deep relationship. And maybe you've said, I have a surface relationship with him, but I want that deeper relationship where I'm intertwined with him, where he is involved in every area of my life. I've given him rule and reign in every area of my life. And there's no better time than now. It's never too late. It's never too late to give him that right, to give him that permission, to give him that place in your life. And man, you won't be disappointed. So I encourage you this week to study those scripture verses or what, on discipleship and what, but really to make your home in his love. Man, isn't that such a cool statement? That has just been in me for weeks now. Make your home in his love. I just feel like that is like, uh, my cousin's here and she always wants to get me a forever lazy. It's this huge, like, blanket that just wraps around you. Man, it, it's cozy and it's comfy and, oh my gosh, that sounds like such a comfy place to be, to make my home in his love. It doesn't have to be a surface thing. It can take over your body. It can take over your life. It can have, it can touch and reach every place in your life. It's that intimate and that's real. And like I said, I know I've stumbled on my words and things have not come out how I wanted, but if I can communicate anything with your heart is that you can have that real relationship with him. You can have that intimacy with him that is real, that is intimate, that is organic, like it said, that just comes from him. You can have that in your life and you can make your home in his love, rest in his love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Como yo otro voz en tu voz en tu voz en tu voz. Como yo en tu voz. Jesus, I thank you that what I can't say, you are saying. And that when we go home this week, that we are just engrossed in your love for us. And we are just willing to go deeper and deeper into our relationship with you. And, and to, to dig into the word of God and let that word take, li- to, to take root in our lives and that we may live out of it all the days of our lives. Discipleship is never too late to start and I'll never fully attain it, but it is something that I'm going to go after all the days of my life. Seeking you. Following you. Obeying all that you ask me to do. From the smallest of things to the largest of things. Lord, I just thank you for this congregation. I thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you for their love for you and for the things of you, Lord God. And I just know that you have called them to do great things. And may they know that it's never too late to do those things. I just thank you. I just encourage you to just take a few minutes, listen to the song. This is an amazing song. And just rest in his love. Your love is so deep. It's more than I can bear. I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. I want to sit at your feet. From the cup of your hand, lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heart beat. Your love is so.
so deep It's more than I can bear I melt in your peace It's overwhelming May we just go out this week and be overwhelmed by his love for us. His, the intimacy that we have with him. May it overwhelm you this week. May it energize you. May it refresh you. And I love you guys, and I speak blessings in your life, and I hope you have an awesome week. Thank you.